officially kick us off. So welcome everybody uh, to today's session. We're gonna be talking about the things that you need to know. There are three areas uh, that are impacting us in the trades, contractors, uh, folks that are servicing clients uh, like the ones that you all have. And we're gonna be diving into some of the things that you need to know in order to prepare for a massively profitable summer. And so what we're doing today is we're bringing together a variety of industry uh, experts from a, a variety of different points of view. I'm Dave Rosendahl. You can see me here on the screen. I'm the president of Mindfire, and it's my honor to be able to moderate the session. So my job is to pull out the insights and the different points of view from this panel that's assembled here together. Now we have to thank for this panel, Andrew Edinger. I'm gonna give him a chance to say hi to everybody here in a second. Andrew is the chief executive of The Best Postcards and they specialize in helping home services businesses grow their brand, generate leads, and drive sales, ultimately uh, generate more revenue. They're servicing over 700 clients in HVAC, electrical, plumbing, roofing, doors, windows, and a whole other uh, slew of industries that I think are applicable to many of you who are here in the room. They're a rapidly growing company. They're finding a lot of success in their unique way of engaging the market. And they're sponsoring today's event. They're leaning heavily into educating the market around what it takes to build a strong, successful, profitable business. And so they're doing today's session. They're bringing us together as a way to help you understand some of the things that you need to know in order to improve your business. So Andrew, I want to really appreciate and thank you for pulling us all together. How are you today? Andrew, I'm I good. And thank you for doing all this presentation for us, Dave. I am Andrew. I am the CEO of the best postcards. As you spoke about this webinar is not about postcards. It's not about marketing per se. It's about getting some industry experts on there and creating an ecosystem for our clients and, you know, for other people who are in the trades to help them navigate these uncertain waters. Absolutely. So important. So let me introduce Tom uh, next. Tom is a third generation SOB. By that, I mean a son of a boss. So he has started, built and sold multiple businesses. I think five, as I look through the list there in the home services space up and down the East Coast. And uh, he's currently the chief visionary officer at his company, Griffin Service, like you can see here on the screen. They're in the Jacksonville, Florida area. They've gone from zero to eight figures in a little over five years. So he's gonna bring an interesting point of view to this conversation from the contractor angle. Tom, I wanna to welcome you to the panel today. How are you? Doing great, Dave, looking forward to it. Awesome, fantastic. We've also got Josh Kelly, a name that if you've worked in the home services industry, odds are you've heard of one of Josh's clients, one of their clients, they grow small up and coming businesses and turn them into giant industry leaders, which I know many of you are, are interested in doing. One of the best examples I've come across is their own family business, which they grew from a little over 6 million in sales to over 200 million in about 17 years. So Josh, I want to welcome you to the panel. How are you doing today? Good, man. I'm excited for this. I came, so I'm actually out at another industry legend right now shop, Dave Geiger helping him outgrow his business. So I'm uh, I'm calling from their conference room right now. Wonderful. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, next up is Matt Corley. You're going to hear from him as well. He's the area equipment manager for Johnson Supply, part of the Wear Group. And uh, they're a leading independent HVACR distributor in Florida and South Carolina, if I'm not mis mistaken. In his role, he works with 150, over 150 AC contractors a year to kind of keep his finger on the pulse of the industry. So in today's conversation, he's going to be bringing you insights from that perspective, which I think you're going to find very insightful. So David, or I'm sorry, Matt, welcome to the panel today. David's coming up here in a second. Matt, welcome to the panel. How are you today? Doing great, David. Very excited to be here. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks for being here, man. I really appreciate it. And then David, last but certainly not least, is the Director of Residential Product Marketing at Daikin, the world's largest HVAC manufacturer. David, I think you joined that company in 2014, if I'm not mistaken, but you've got 25 years of experience in product marketing and mechanical engineering. And what excites me about uh, you joining the conversation today is that you're going to be able to bring to us that perspective from Daikin and your work in product marketing and the the, the work that you div, do there at the company. So welcome, David. It's great to have another David on the panel. I hope I don't confuse myself, but thanks for being here, man. I appreciate you. How are you this morning? Doing, doing, doing great and uh, really excited to, to be part of this and uh, looking forward to uh, some great conversations uh, the rest of the hour. Fantastic. 
Thank you, David. Here's how we're going to do this, everybody. Let's get into the questions. I don't want to spend any more time on the housekeeping. I want to get right into the tough stuff. Here's how it's going to work. We have over 200 questions that were submitted in advance of this session. So quite a bit of interest um, in the topics that we're talking about here. And my team and I, we went through them and pulled out the questions that are the most representative of what this group seems to want to know in the three core areas that we're going to be focused on today. So I'm going to guide the discussion through those and uh, pose these questions to the panel. Panelists, try to be brief in your responses as we discuss so that we can get through as many of these as possible. Here's where we're gonna start, folks. Good, looks like everybody's on board with the, uh, the game plan for today. I'm gonna start off with this. You'll see the three areas that we're talking about here on the screen. Uh, Brad, Kelly, I don't know if Brad is here from Snyder AC. In advance, he sent us this note. He said, geez, there's a lot going on. Keeping up with customer, customer demand, supply chain issues, not breaking my call center. You know, he, his, his point of view was there's a lot of things that are coming at us right now. Andrew, what would you say it is as you look across the industry right now? Which of these three is most difficult? Across this, this industry and all the other verticals we deal with, it's definitely the supply chain issues. All right, Tom, what do you say? I would say supply chain as well. Josh, what are you seeing? I think most people on this call think it's recruiting and retention, but it's because they don't have a plan for it. The one thing that's outside of our hands is supply chain. Matt, what do you see? So I'm answering from a distributor perspective, so I'm definitely saying supply chain. All right, and David? I'm answering from a manufacturing perspective, definitely supply chain. Supply chain. All right. So yeah, folks, we've got a lot coming at us right now. And that's why this panel and this discussion is so important. Uh, our goal, my goal in this conversation with you is to draw out some insights from these experts here uh, to give you a spark of an idea and something that you can take to the work that you're doing and figure out how to push back on some of these uh, difficult issues. So we're going to jump right in now with supply chain. That's kind of the first set of questions we're going to talk about here. And I'm going to direct this question to you, Josh, first. And this question came in from James, but also a number of people. It, let me read how James put it. He said, after three years, why are we still having supply chain issues? What's really going on here? And when will it end? So Josh, how would you answer that? So, I mean, I, I know a lot of you people don't know who I am or my background, but like I talk with almost every manufacturer and have a relationship with everybody at this point. I think it's healthy to do so, not just from... My standpoint, you know, I think all smog contractors have to do this now. You have to have relationships with everybody because there is this supply chain issue. The real reason that's happening is it's a, it's a purposeful choice from the manufacturers and it's a raw material issue. So they're having trouble getting raw material. That's a big piece of it. Another piece of it is historically they've learned that when there's big surges of demand in our industry, what we really do is we don't create demand, we move up demand. So what I mean by that is, you know, our company's in Phoenix, right? If there's a, there was a big hailstorm years ago and everyone went crazy. It was amazing, right? But then the next year there was a drop down, not for us, but for a lot of companies because they weren't prepared for it. So the, the manufacturers think that we've moved up demand, not necessarily create new demand. So they've decided to not, they don't want to be stuck with a bunch of extra inventory. So the combination of having trouble getting raw materials and this theory that demand is going to be lower, they've decided to produce less unit. Right or wrong, that's what they've decided, and they've kind of decided across the board. So we're going to have a shortage at least this year. Next year, I kind of, I mean, who knows? They make budgeting decisions throughout the year, and they ramp up and ramp down as they go. But for right now, we're all going to have shortages on equipment. And then the other side, like flex, that's just a pure raw material issue. So Matt, what's your perspective on this? Uh, let's, let's address James' question here. Why are we still having these issues? What's really going on? And do you have a crystal ball? When will it end? Yeah, I wish that was the magic question. And I really thought about this a lot, David, to come up with a really concrete answer. But I mean, guys, it, it's virtually impossible. Like we, same thing like Josh was saying, we work with hundreds of different vendors and it just goes uphill. They don't know. So therefore we don't know. So we can't communicate to our customers as much as we would like to, because it's a worldwide economy. I mean, that we're truly living it and experiencing it and everything that happened with COVID. I know we all want to move past that, but cause the ports to shut down. We're still having trucking issues. You know, even in the 21, some of the ports in LA were still had 45, 50 ships sitting there anchored. They can't unload them. Like it's just causing a multiplied effect. And I know we can turn on our new station of source and 
and see that, but it, it is true and it's causing real damage, you know, to the supply chain. That as well as, you know, I'd put the question back to this group, like, tell me when the Ukraine war is going to end because yeah. that's causing real issues. Something like 90% of the nickel in the economy is distributed, exported out of Ukraine. Well, that's a key component in making circuit boards. So, you know, there's too many factors there, unfortunately, but we're all feeling it. So it's just trying to make our best path through it. David, your view, why are we still having these issues and any insight as to when this may alleviate? Yeah, I'd like to go back to something Josh uh, said a few minutes ago. I, I think there's a lot of validity um, and, and a lot of what he shared as far as from a manufacturing perspective. You know, I, I, there, there is one thing he mentioned that I, I don't know, at least speaking from a Daikin perspective, where Josh, you had mentioned, you know, the manufacturers not wanting to get stuck with inventory if, you know, if the bubble bursts or whatever. I, I can say holistically that's a, a very valid uh, statement, but at least for Daikin, you know, that the supply chain issues that we're seeing are, are, are real coming in from a lot of our suppliers. It could be raw materials. It could be something as simple as a screw. And, you know, I think that the whole supply chain from each manufacturer through the whole industry is, you know, I think it's very prevalent from a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different reasons. Even, even, you know, we look at raw goods, it could be is just a staffing issue that caused that shortage, or it could be some other driver that, you know, that's some other factor that supplied that. So I, I think there is a lot going on, you know, all through the distribution chain. And one of the things that we've been trying to do is really uh, focus in on some of the high running SKUs to really try to drive some manufacturing efficiency through to overcome some of the shortages, but that is only as good as the supply chain. So again, you know, we can really get those economies of scale and, and some of the high running products through the factory to really drive that efficiency, but that's only as good as making sure that we have the right incoming components. Nick says here in the chat, the trucking shortage, worker shortages at stalled ports, demand being up, supply being down, the geopolitical environment, weather setback, COVID, and more. Nick, you hit the nail on the head. It's a confluence of all of these things. Yeah. It's really creating a, a, a super difficult, uh, challenging situation. David, I'm just curious, at Daikin, do you have, and I know, again, I'm, nobody's got a crystal ball here, but just to follow up on what you just said there, when might this end? Yeah. Every time that somebody asks me that, I, 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 I keep saying that we're, uh, we've got to be getting close, but, you know, it, it's, it, it really is a tough question. And I think, you know, just you know, every time you, you turn around, there's, you know, a, a new. of COVID yep. and a, a lot of different things that uh, really have an influence on that. I um, mean, you hear about, yep. you know, parts of China, you know, shutting down again, and there's a lot of supply components, whether individual components or finished goods that, that come through there. So a lot of challenges ahead. So, Tom, I'm going to throw this next question at you here. This came in from Doug um, at the AC Doctors, and Doug says... Supply chain issues are demanding so much of my team's time. How are others handling this? In other words, it's, it, it's just sucking up so much of their time that they're finding it hard to do anything else. Tom, what's your perspective on how companies can address that? You know, Dave, my attitude towards these things is always starts with things happen for us, not to us. So the supply chain is the supply chain. And rather than kind of focus on the negativity of it, we, we kind of focus on how do we solve it? right? We're solutions kind of folks. And so it starts with partnering with vendors and partnering with manufacturers. So partnering with the Johnstone, partnering with a Daikin, trying to figure out, have a, have a partner conversation, not a vendor conversation and, and really get, get the behind the scenes, like level with me, tell me what's going on. What can we do? You keep telling me what we can't do. What can we do? In our case, we've expanded our warehouse space. Matt's seen it. Josh has seen it. Daikin's been in and worked with us on it. So we've got a much larger warehouse space to now increase inventory levels so it changes cash flow and and some of those things but we've got to kind of become our own mini distributor to be ahead of supply chain issues for as many things as possible it does require us to get really good at forecasting and evolving with forecasting something that a contractor we're not usually used to forecasting you know equipment and inventory so we can rely on our distributor like a johnstone or our vendor like a daikin to be like how do we they're good at that we suck at it so how do we get them to help us out it, it's it's 
it's focusing on it having like a cadence to daily, weekly, monthly, like what is the flow? What are we going to do? And for us, one of the things I think David kind of alluded to it is we looked at our SKUs with our distributors and your manufacturers, and we we decreased the SKUs. We said, okay, here's the two or three things we're going to offer. So we could focus all of our guns and all of our energy onto those SKUs from an inventory perspective, from a price book perspective, from a training perspective, from a marketing perspective. So that has also really allowed us to kind of pull in what we need and, and have a better conversation with customers around the supply chain. So I don't know if that makes sense, but focus, simplify, cut down the SKUs, get partnered with your vendors and manufacturers. And, you know, maybe right now don't beat them up. It's not uh, Matt's fault. It's not Dave's fault that they're having these issues. They're, they're, you know, poop rolls downhill. We all got to deal with it. Josh, I'm going to come to you because I know you work with a lot of companies in this situation, but I want to read what Michael said here in the chat, managing inventory. This is Michael Chapman. Thank you, Michael. Managing inventory on a daily basis now is, is how they're doing it. They're trying to stay ahead of it. It used to work weekly and it's just so easy to not get items that we got to stay ahead of it. So I think you're saying that it's taking a, a different approach um, to how you're managing inventory. Thank you for putting that in there, Michael. Josh, so across the companies that you're helping, across the companies that you're servicing, how are they handling the fact that this takes up so much dang time? Yeah, a quick, quick shout out, Doug and Pete for, from AC Doctors to bring it up. But yeah, I think we've all shifted in the way we handle partners, right? I've always been a big fan of like, you know, you don't bring out a vendor, you bring a partner and you have a, as close relationship as you can. The better your relationship, the better your pricing, the better the service. You still have to shop, you still have to keep them honest, right? But you, you dive into that, right? But to a point, we all, if you're a smaller shop, you would kind of have a relationship with one vendor and you'd have a really strong relationship with your larger shop. You generally have two, potentially three, depending on your size. And that's not the case anymore. And even manufacturers and vendors would tell you like, hey, I can't get this equipment, right? So you have to have multiple relationships with multiple vendors now. So you need to have those conversations now, not in the middle of summer when you're already backed out. So that's one change. Number two, and this is maybe not what everybody wants to hear, but it's just the honest truth. Like you need to have a conversation with your partners every single day without exception in the morning, uh, find out what's actually available in your area. And literally you sell what you can get your hands on. You don't, if, if you know, you're having trouble in your area, getting, you know, difficult getting a 16 CR2 tape system, guess what? It's not going to be one of our options today. And you move on, right? You sell what you have the potential of getting your hands on. So it's changed our our sales process. It's changed who we worked with, and it's changed our daily cadence of keeping up on inventory. Because normally we would do that, you know. Really, we didn't do it almost at all. We just always relied on equipment being there. Now we have to check in every single morning with every single one of our partners and see what's actually available in our warehouse, not what their what not what their you know their online inventory system says, because that's sometimes accurate, sometimes not. It actually takes a physical phone call every morning and someone actually looking at their supply house. So it's shifted a lot and that's a lot of work, obviously, but what's more work, you know, having those conversations or selling something you can't get your, get your hands on. Right. Andrew, before I go to Matt, I saw that you raised your hand. Go ahead, Andrew. Did you want to interject a point here? Yeah, two points. One real quick, one to Josh's point is that we find that with our, our clients and our partners, that they are very accepting of alternative products at this point. They understand that there is a global supply chain crisis and that they, they are accepting of taking pro whatever they can get at this point right now. My second point would be with the supply chain is knowing that you have limited supply. Maybe it's a time to focus on your existing clients more. If we are headed into a recession at some point, you know, those are relationships that we want to build on. So we want to keep them happy first before we go out and we prospect. And I, I'm saying that building relationships is, is where your revenue is going to come from most of the time going forward. So, you know, that's where I accentuate. Makes sense. Matt, briefly, your thoughts on this in terms of how folks can address the fact that this takes up so much time in their business. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to reinforce kind of what Tom and Josh said, but from a distributor perspective, guys understand like if you're whatever fields you're in, whatever vertical um, on the contracting perspective is that your distributor can be doing, trying to get the best job they can, get the information out to you, but 
we get surprised too. We get surprised all the time when, you know, we, something we typically had a lead time of five to 10 days turns into three to four months as, and we have great relationships in place, but still it just, the information isn't always there. But that being said, the best way that you can mitigate those issues is just what Tom and Josh said is those relationships are key and you have to view yourself because this is what your distributor is looking for. They're looking for a partner. We don't have the luxury right now of being able to sell everything we want. So flex and the AC business is something that's in high demand. We get calls all the time. We get random calls from people coming out of the woodwork that want to buy everything. And we are having to choose who do we want to do business with, not just today, mm. but who is going to be a partner level dealer tomorrow, next year, and years to come. That's what we're looking for. That's what we have to look for right now. David, your view from Daikin, how do you see this? Yeah, most of our um, components as a manufacturer, we, we usually are, are dual sourced really way prior to a lot of these supply chain issues. And, and now in a lot of cases, we actually have a, a third source that we're, we're really we set up for a lot of these um, components. But the, the big takeaway there is, is we've really shifted resources to 100% focus on supply chain uh, component selection. And we beefed up that part of our organization to really make sure that, you know, they're, they're working kind of almost around the clock, securing the components just to uh, try to get ahead of it. So we've thought differently about that part of our organization to make sure that we're uh, prepared for, for what lies ahead. All right, I'm going to move to the next section of questions here. A staff recruiting and retention. I know that this is a significant issue for many organizations. First up is a question from Jim from Service Nation. And I'm going to throw this first at you, Josh. I know this is something that you're passionate about. Jim is asking, Josh, what are some innovative ways to recruit and find good people? What's working right now, Josh? Yeah, lots of things are working, right? So I think a lot of people want like a, like a haymaker here, like, if I just do this, I'm going to have recruiting solved, but that's just not how it works. Like you have to do a bunch of things, right? It's really about time, money, and effort. And if you really break it down, most contractors don't spend a lot of time, money, and effort on what really could be their biggest growth potential, which is recruiting retention. In fact, most don't even have a retention program at all. And most recruiting is very, very basic, right? But there are some crazy stuff that you can do kind of outside the box. I can go through like a list of like a 30, I think we have like 32 different unique recruiting methods. Why don't we do this? Make it easy though. Instead of going through them one by one, Dave, David, make sure to reach out to me or Laura afterwards. We'll just give that to everybody yep. that's on this call. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, my team, please help me remember to do that. And we'll include that in the follow-up for everybody. That That's very helpful, Josh. Matt, I'm going to turn that same question to you. What are you seeing? Innovative ways to recruit and find good talent. Yeah, so I wanted to weigh on this, but I, I will um, acknowledge that I think Josh and Tom will have more practical responses to this. But again, I, I meet with probably 100, 150 different contractors a year. And the thing that I've seen and noticed, the ones that are really successful, they have the same philosophy with their marketing, which is they're branded. And no matter what industry you're in, if your go-to-market strategy for recruiting is hey, we're a family-owned business that's been around since the 80s and we give good customer service. That's cool. That's not different. That's, not, that's, that's white noise. So if you're trying to bring in high-level employees, you need to decide who you really are, what that message is, and then promote the hell out of it to find those like-minded people to bring into your company. Tom, I'm going to throw this to you, but I want to read what Michael uh, says here in the chat. Michael Chapman again says, we pay employees with a bonus when they refer people and they get hired. It has worked very nicely here at Evergreen Pest and Lawn. So Michael, thank you for that. Tom, what are you finding? Uh, innov innovative ways to find and, and uh, recruit good people. I think that I was curious to see when people were posting the initial thought, there was like a split between supply chain and recruiting. And it kind of tells you a little bit who's doing and thinking like Josh suggested, who's on it, who's planning, who's putting a focus and resources towards it versus, you know, who's waiting till the last minute. Like I can't hire anybody. To me, recruiting is kind of like a baseball system. There's free agency and there's a farm system. And, you know, free agents cost more money. They're harder to get. They come with bad habits a lot of the time, but you want them. You want that free agent pitcher for your team, you know, whatever, when they're available. We found similar to what Michael said for uh, recruiting, we find our best free agents from our existing team. So we... 
work with our team, we coach our team, we reward our team to bring in free agents who fit. The nice part about that is they know who they want to work with. They know who the fit is. So it kind of me meshes up a little bit better. But I think the real place to, to get ahead is going to be in the, in the farm system. And so you hear a lot of these big contractors building in training centers, classes, schools, paid internships, and, and us too. We've been successful over the years doing that a lot. And we, we do it now. We incubate our own people. We can recruit for attitude and, and core values and things that match our company. We can give them the skills. So there's a lot of uh, expense to that. And I think, you know, Josh can talk about it. I know him and his dad have a philosophy along the same line. We're paying all those costs. We're investing in those people with classes, with ride longs, with, you know, whatever to build them kind of an assembly line technician. The, the thing that is key, Matt said it, and it, it's brand, brand equity, brand awareness, but it's really culture, right? It's who are the right people to fit our company. And I think the culture is the future of that farm system who get good people. We can teach them how to do the skills over a period of time. And what I would say in this regard, why it's so important to do what Josh is saying is used to be a saying that was, you know, whoever controls the, the marketing controls the market. We're in a time now where whoever controls the labor controls mm -hmm. the market. So we've got to really think about this plan in a very proactive, futuristic way, not a reactive way. And I think, you know, in all the markets I, I continue to work and do business in, and I'm sure other people on the call feel the same way. They wait until there's like, oh, we need a tech. Let's put an ad on Indeed. Let's go get a tech. You, you've missed it by two months at that point, where the more proactive people are hiring literally 365 they're recruiting, they're evaluating their staff, you know, they're ranking their staff, A, B, C. How do we move the C's to B's, the B's to A? How do we dump guys out? Where do we fit people in? So it's very much around, and Josh and I think are very aligned in this thinking. It, it's like a full effort, no different than your marketing, no different than your budgeting, no different than your inventory planning. Your staffing needs to be an actual conscientious message or, or, or cadence to it. So we meet now every week in our leadership meeting recruiting and retention is part of that conversation. And something we've done that's a little innovative, we've actually hired a happiness officer to do nothing, curate birthdays and anniversaries and work anniversaries and acknowledge, you know, great reviews and things because I think a lot of people think it's about the money and the money is just a given nowadays, right, Josh? The money is just there. You're going to pay the money, but they don't go for the money. And the guy who changes for the money, he's going to leave you for the money too. So how do we create that culture? And that's going to be really dialing in and, and getting to know the people on a, on a human level. A little different for an AC tech or a plumber or a roofer, but we got to get into the weeds with these people and have a human interest in them. And I think that's, that's going to be the strategy long term. Scott with Super Heat and Air in Tampa, Florida is saying that investing the time and energy with on-site training is the best way to build your team. You get to mold and shape them into the employees that fit the culture of your company. I'm going to uh, turn next to a question that came in from Carl. Uh, let's see, from Carl. Yes, uh, still around staff recruiting and retention from Sam's Heating and Air. And the question, Andrew, I'm going to go to you first on this one. Uh, the question here is, how do I retain employees that tend to leave just before it gets busy every year for offers of higher pay. So Andrew, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I kind of leave that on uh, top-down management. If your people are leaving right at that peak of the season, then you're not doing the right things during the regular, you know, course of the, the other parts of the year. It's, it's, it's the culture, it's the brand, it's creating incentive programs. You know, we have a saying where we work that we don't let good talent pass. And I'd rather overpay somebody 10 or $15,000 and go through five people at $15,000 less and, and look at my books at the end of the year and see that I have $250,000 of the people who are no longer with me. So I think when you find good talent, you take it, you keep it, and you create a culture and you don't let any poison it. You know, and as far as 
offering incentives and referral programs and bonuses and all that. If, if overall you're taking care of your clients, like Tom said, if you've created a brand where, where people know that you're going to be around and that people want to work for you, we, I don't, I don't see that problem. I think that's a self-created problem. Tom, what about you? I'm sure you have an insight here. Does this happen to you? Has it ever happened to you where folks leave right before the busy time of the year and, uh, you know, in hopes of higher pay? How do you retain those types of people? Andrew's right. I, I always say when I have a problem, I kind of figure, I try to figure out what's the real issue. You got to get upstream of this. And so if this is happening in my mind, this has been happening before the event. It's been going on for a while. Like it's been brewing. Someone's been waiting you out and you, you just, you you're surprised by it. That's the problem. You're surprised by it. So, you know, I think that the best, uh, cultures, they, they get with their people two or three times a month, whether it's managers, team leaders, they, they check in with their people. They, they invest in their people and the people know it. They, they continuously educate their team. They don't take for granted. The guy's been in the business for 15 years. He doesn't need education. He always needs to be invested in. He needs to feel the love or she needs to feel the love. If someone does leave in that situation for me, I personally go say, let's grab lunch, let's grab a, a coffee, a beer, whatever. I want to know, what did we do? And what I found through the time, and it's maybe cliche, is people don't leave companies. They leave managers or situations. There's something yeah. else brewing. So if you left me for money at the, at the beginning of busy season or whatever, you really, there's something else brewing there and I better fix it. Otherwise, the, the stampede of people leaving is going to go. And these guys who leave, I would say maybe 80, 20, they have the potential to be the Pied Piper, right? They can actually now go to their new boss who says, hey, do you know anybody? We can give them a sign-on bone. Like all of a sudden you lost this guy because you didn't take care of business and do your housekeeping all the while with that employee you already had. And now he goes over and it's the honeymoon period. So he tells all of his buddies who used to work with, and it usually leads to more than one person exiting but it's all about getting upstream to me and having a real conversation and helping make sure the people understand how they fit in your culture, how they fit in your, your vision. And if they do, they feel like they're part of something. Of course, it's great pay, great benefits, but they have to feel part of something. Josh, what's your counsel? How do you consult with folks who have this issue? What's your insight? I mean, everybody has this issue at some point. It's just the real world, right? That's when they're most likely to leave is right before the busy season, which by the way, you know that ahead of time. So you can be proactive about it, right? People generally don't leave in the middle of the slow season. You know when they're going to leave. You know when you need to protect your team, right? So it's a combination of a few things. Number one, obviously, like you need to pay appropriately. You need to have a pay plan that makes sense and that gets exciting about it. Because if there's a huge gap, it's hard to overcome. A small gap you can, though. And, and the truth is you always want to be the highest paying guy anyway, right? That's the goal, as long as it also makes you money. It's important to realize, though, like people come for money, but that's not the reason that they stay. People stay because of relationships. And that doesn't necessarily have to mean they have a tight relationship with you as the owner, but they're better with their service manager or supervisor, right? They have to feel connected and part of something larger than themselves. That's the secret to retention. It's not paying really, really effectively. That's a small mm. piece of it. And it is a piece of it. But it's, does that technician feel welcome and part of a team and part of a family? And if you can achieve that, the odds of them leaving is significantly lower. Everybody leaves at some point, right? Everybody without exception leaves at some point. You, we always hope it's for retirement, but they're going to leave, right? I want to choose when they leave and have the most effect on them. So... It's, it's really the relationship that I think you need to focus on. And, and the other side is so many companies focus on recruiting, 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 and you should because you're growing, 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 right? But you better have a retention program too, right? You have to put thought into it. Now, how do I create an amazing experience for my customers, which are my team members, right? How do I blow their mind every day and make them excited to come and work and make them love the process? And if you put a lot of thought, uh, time, money, and effort into that, you could, you, you could really solve that recruiting problem or that retention problem. You always have some people leave because everybody's going to leave at some point, but you won't have people leave in droves and you'll be able to predict when they leave, right? Like if I'm going to have someone leave, it's going to be during the off season. This is something that I think we all know is a problem. What I'm going to do is I'm going to throw the first question at you, Tom. So get ready. Uh, this is a question from Julie. Julie's company is FSM HVAC. And Julia is saying, how is everyone keeping up with rapidly increasing costs 
And how should this impact my marketing messages, which is an interesting angle there. So Tom, what's your thought on how to do that? Those two issues, we'll kind of look at those separately. First, in terms of the keeping up, it, it's become at least a weekly thing. And so again, that partnership back to the first question with your distri distributors, like keep me updated, let me know what's coming. Let me know, don't wait till that it happens to react to it. You should know what's coming down the pipeline. It's created a lot more monthly financial analysis to sit down and kind of break down the line items of your budget to say, where are we seeing things rising either over last year at a faster rate or versus budget? Do we have enough budget in here? Are we still maintaining our margins? Don't wait till the, the end of time to go, did we, or didn't we make money? So financial and looking at your numbers, whether it's QuickBooks or something, just, I like to look at things as percentages, right? Percent of revenue, mm. percent of department revenue. So I can see trends. I think staying ahead of it is you got to implement the increases before they hit. And we've had a methodology that we're implementing increases on a monthly basis. So where it's a softer increase to our customers, when instead of here's a 5% or 8% increase, we can do you know, one and a half, 2% a month and move it up slowly, kind of like boiling the frog a little bit. So that's kind of the, the idea of staying in tune with it and good software, having active inventory, knowing your cost, job costing, you know, it's just kind of blocking and tackling stuff. As far as the marketing yeah. usage goes, my, my take on this would be, I think marketing, you can't explain everything in marketing. And in our industry, nobody wants to buy what we're selling. It's a grudge purchase. So no one really wants to buy a new water here. No one really wants to buy a new AC. No one really wants to buy a new roof. They have to buy it. And it's a lot of money and they probably didn't plan for it, but we already have a hard enough time getting in the door. The goal to me, Andrew knows this and he drove it in my head for years, get in the damn door, get in the house, have a conversation. Once we're there, then we can have the explanation of rising costs, things like that they're not, their head isn't buried in the sand. They don't live in a, a cave. They know this is going on, but I think any marketing messages confuses the marketing message to me versus I just want to get a technician to your home to do a thing that makes sense. And then we can have a better conversation once we're in the house. I don't know if that makes sense for the answer to the question, but I'm not changing my marketing messages. Like get it, before the price increases or get it now, there's only 12 left or supply chain shortages. The messaging was always same day, next day service and install. So that's the same drum we're beating. When we get in, we will say, listen, there's only like Josh said, Hey, we only got three available first come first serve or prices are going up in four weeks and it's going to be a thousand dollars more. We can be transparent at that point, but it's not a marketing message to me. Josh, let's let's focus in on that aspect right there that Julie asked. How does or how should the rapidly increasing costs impact the marketing message? Love to hear your view on that. Yeah, let me let me real quick just tackle one thing before the first half of her question. And I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. Like you could take any price increase, do any marketing plan, have any pay plan. You can do literally anything you want as long as you pass off the cost to the customer. So every industry does it. We need to do it too. I think just as important to reiterate that, you know, when we take a price increase and really before we take a price increase, you need to increase your pricing, like protect your margins. You have to make money too. So just be aware of that. And then I'm going to disagree with Tom super quick. He said he does it every single month to protect against customers uh, taking a hit, right? It's never the customers that have price objections, not in reality, like not for the vast majority of the services. It's our technicians that feel like it's expensive and then the customers have issue with it, right? So mm -hmm. you really need to sell these price increases to the technician. That's where you get yourself in trouble, right? As far as the marketing message, I agree with Tom. Like it's, it's probably, it depends how you're set up, right? If your core message is based off like really install offers and, and you're pushing and you're not really creating a brand image and you're not really building experience and you're that price driven person, which is maybe not what I would play, but lots of people play it, right? I'm going to be the, the least expensive in town. I'm going to get the game that way. Then you could create some urgency by doing this. But most of us want to play either the speed of service or the quality game. Most of us play the quality game, in which case they understand pricing is going up. So I don't have to educate them. 
and my urgency, I accomplish more effectively in other ways. So it's not a big marketing push for me right now. That being said, if like, hey, I'm the only one with generators right now, electrical generators. Yeah, I'll, I'll promote that because my competition can't, but that's far and few between and not really applicable to most people. So I hope that kind of answered the questions there. Yeah. Andrew, I'm going to come to you in just a second, but let me give Matt a chance to answer this briefly, Matt, because there are still a bunch of questions we want to get to, and then I'll come to you, Drew. Matt, what's your thought on this question? Yeah, just direct to the point. I, I agree with what Tom said about communication is key. Okay. So you yourself are staying on top of what's going on with price increases. And then just to put something in everyone's you know mind to think about is... We talk about communication, but there's definitely a lot more coming in, the, in terms of technology. I mean, I'm familiar with the AC industry, but there's a lot more coming to where we can tap into a customer's software system that they're using, and we can send directly, instantly current pricing every day. So that way, if you have your margins there, you're never behind on a price increase. You're never not communicated to. So I don't know everyone's industry, but just keep your eye open for stuff like that. Drew, you want to add a point? I wanted to just add to what Josh said, and he hit it right on the head. It is our technicians, it is our salespeople who have the objections that, that have trouble going in and asking for the money. Because me as a consumer, if you come in and you're offering me a 16 C or whatever it is unit, and it's $16,000 and it, it was 16,000 last month, but I didn't know it. And you come in and it's $18,000 this month. I have no clue what an air conditioner goes for. You know, you come in and you offer me this air conditioner and you have it in stock, I'm paying the $18,000. So it really is not an objection on the consumer's behalf. It's, it's more getting our own people behind it and understand that there's value in it because this is what's available and this is what the price is you know what we have to pay and what we have to sell and so i'm going to hit the first question here in marketing and go right back to you andrew on this so we're going to move out of the the cost and the inflation issues and now talk specifically about a marketing question that came in here from james at southwest blinds james is saying here andrew we need more leads how can i increase the number of new leads coming in and does a possible recession impact my lead flow andrew what's your thought Okay, so I'll, I'll hit the second point first. A recession definitely will impact your lead flow, but if, as a business owner, we should all be running our businesses as if we're in a recession at all times. First thing is know who your customer is. Know who, you know, there are probably like four classifications of customers. That, you know, you have the cautious customer, you have maybe the comfortable customer, you have the 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 customer who just is well off and you the, the the maybe the I don't give a shit customer who just blows his money on technology or whatever so you got to remember who you are who you're trying to market to who your brand is try not to change your brand to compete with a different model try not to if you're if you're a, a, a top tier company don't try and fight into the lower end market to try you know Offer bundles instead of price decreases. People still want to do business with, with the top tier companies, the companies that they know that are going to be around to service their product. This is a great opportunity for, for existing, existing companies to become the new wave of big companies. As far as lead gen, I would say marketing, obviously to your own customers and cross selling is absolutely, is the lowest hanging fruit. And then whether it's geofencing or whether it's radiuses or, you know, um, with, with either mail or, or Google AdWords or retargeting, but homes are built at the same time in the same neighborhoods. So the lowest hanging fruit is your existing clients and knowing that if one person has a problem, that the chances are the neighborhood has a problem because homes are built at the same time. So I would hone things in and keep a, a tighter radius around where you're marketing as opposed to driving out 70 miles for a for a, a lead that could be a $49 tune-up call and takes your you know where you think you need more employees takes your guy off the road for what he should be doing four calls a day but now he can only do one because you have to drive 70 miles one way and 70 miles 70 miles back so that would be my take Tom, let's try to be as brief as we can here, but this is an important question. How does a possible recession impact my lead flow and how do I increase the number of leads that I have coming in? Thoughts? 
think that uh, the first thing is we already have more leads. It's called unconverted leads we didn't sell. So let's work on the sale, you know, the phone call to conversion. Look at all your conversion rates. There's like piles of gold in the unconverted. So before you say more leads, which are going to mm. cost you more money, why don't we maximize out and rehash all of our existing leads? The other side of that is, is I think back to brand equity, right? Like all of your marketing will work better, whether it's pay-per-click, SEO, mail, radio, billboards. If you have a brand that has equity within the marketplace. So running around trying to be the jack of all trades, you have zero brand equity. So what, what's your story? What could you own? What message? What could you be famous for, or infamous for in your brand equity? Uh, that would be my take. And I think that there's a key, Andrew said before, in, in a recession, our existing customers are going to become even more valuable to us to help them and communicate with them and stay on par with them. Josh, I'm going to go to you and then to you, Matt. So Josh, your thoughts on this. I'm sure you have a perspective here. I'm going to, I'm going to be difficult here and I'm going to call bullshit. I'm going to call total bullshit. A, a recession affects the industry. It does not affect my call volume. Cause here's what I mean by that. In 2008, everybody like the housing market crash, there was a huge recession. It was our biggest growth years by far, right? Because here's what happens. Everyone else panics and they pull back. And I mm -hmm. didn't, we leaned in, right? During recession, it means you have to be more creative, right? You have to be more aware of your numbers. You have to be more efficient. But this is not like, hey, my call volume is going to go down. I have to prepare for that. That's bullshit. It doesn't have to go down. You just, the way you're doing marketing now is probably going to have to shift, right? But by the way, the way everyone else is doing marketing shifts too. And a lot of your competitors will pull money out and they'll stop marketing, which by the way, even though there's less lead, that means you have the opportunity to get a larger percentage of those leads, right? You gain market share during those times, right? So I would challenge everybody on this call to like, you can make excuses and you can blame outside forces in our industry, right? I, I play in the HVAC plumbing electrical industry, right? Everybody tells me, ah, man, the weather's not good. So we just didn't have the call volumes. So we didn't get the sales. It's like, no, man, what are you talking about? You have to go get sales when the weather's not good. Any monkey can make money in Phoenix in the middle of the summertime. That's not sophisticated business. You have to go out and you have to do the things that other people are unwilling to do, right? So don't, don't put yourself in this box and say, if a recession hits, I'm going to accept lower call volume. I'm going to accept less sales. I'm going to accept less profit. That's not true. That's a cop-out you give yourself. And if you give yourself your, that cop-out, you will get less call volume and you will yeah. get less sales and you will like make less money, but it's bullshit. There's still plenty of business to go out there and get. In fact, during recession, it becomes easier because we have less competition. Yeah, exactly what you just said here in the chat, Tom. We choose not to participate in any recession. And I don't want to miss an opportunity here. If you think that you are ready to lean into, as Andrew said, you know, making sure that we think as business owners and leaders that we're marketing is something we should always do, no matter whether we're in a recession or not. And we need to think in a different way. And if we agree with what Josh is saying that, hey, you know what, that would be something that we let happen to us. And instead, we got to be proactive. This event, this panel is sponsored by the Best Postcard. So if you need help leaning into your marketing, and if you need help uh, doing some of the things that uh, we've been talking about here. Go to either thebestpostcards.com. There's a form on every page, at the bottom of every page there. Or let us know in the chat if you want to talk about any of the things that we've uh, discussed today. Or if you're looking to amplify your marketing, uh, prospect bifolds, postcards, radius mailers like uh, Andrew mentioned a second ago, uh, thank you cards, valve tags, referral cards, uh, email campaigns. Those are the types of things that the team here can help with. And we want to make sure uh, that we get you that help. So MindFire team, if you don't mind, drop the URL into the chat, thebestpostcards.com here in Zoom, as well as in LinkedIn. Matt, I don't want to forget you. What are your thoughts on the upcoming possible recession and uh, what that means about lead flow? So yeah, I'll be quick because I know we're trying to get to last questions here. I, I agree with a lot of these guys, and I think it goes back to what we talked about with recruiting is you have to intimately know your brand and who you are, what differentiates yourself in the market, and then also know what your target customer is. I mean, down to the the sharpest degree you could get that create an avatar give it a name if you need to and then every morning you need to go how do i find more of that person you know what do i need to do and practically how do you what kind of marketing do you need to do to find those leads 
it really depends on what market you're in. I mean, I, I'm all over Florida and what works in Tampa is different than Orlando, is different than the villages, is different than Jacksonville. That's where you need to partner with someone well that can help you do that analysis. All right, I've got one more question here. It's a question that I love. Thank you, Matt, for your, your insight on that. And I want to throw this to Josh first. This is a question I often ask, and it's this. I came in from Jim at Black Hack. Hawk? I'm not sure. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Apologies if I mangled it. Jim is asking, what I don't see coming is what I worry about. So, Josh, I'm going to go to you first, briefly. What's something that not many people talk about that I should be worried about? Josh? I don't know. I don't know if it's not something that people talk about, but necessarily pay attention to, but we talk about all the time. And that's the kind of consolidation of our industry and the technology improvements. So many companies make this, let, let me actually shift. That's true. And I, I could go in that, but let something you're not paying attention that will totally change your business. Let's do that. So many people in our industry pay attention only to people in our industry. Mm. Like they take from the best contractors and that's good. And you should do that. And I'm not disagreeing, but you can learn so much. I'm here at one of the most successful contractors in the United States. Dave Geiger is literally a legend in an industry. And I'm talking to him about like, they're going through step-by-step -step repetitive processes on how to put in warranty information. And, you know, they, they have box stores. So all the stuff that they have to fill in box stores, I'm like, so you you're paying a full-time person here in town to do this. Why don't you hire a VA in the Philippines? And like, what's a VA? I'm like, you know exactly what a VA can do. You ever called a credit card company and get somebody in India? Like that's a virtual assistant. It's someone who works in a different country that costs you two to $300 a month. And do you think that you can teach them how to get in service tight and have real only access and just fill out warranty cards? Hell yes, we can, right? Like this is common sense stuff. It's not mind blowing, right? But you can do this if you look outside of what everyone else is doing and think about Hey, there's other industries that are doing crazy good stuff. Why aren't we doing that? Why don't we test Matt, it out? What, see if we could do it. Nice, 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 nice. Matt, the known unknowns here. What's something that people aren't thinking about that we should be worried about? Briefly. Yeah, I wish you all knew crystal ball, right? But I, I agree with the other part of what Josh said, which is technology. I mean, to me, technology is the big differentiator that could really shake up whatever home services company you're in and just put you know, look back, you know, 10 years ago, who would have thought the taxi service companies would be out of business almost because of Uber, you know, look at everything that's being delivered now. Like, you know, everything gets shaken up when high technology comes into place and that we can't be immune to think that couldn't happen in our industry. So where the gigification of home services could happen, meaning Uber type philosophy could come in to where your techs now sit at home, they wait on an app for an offer to come in. And the supplies, whatever be painting or roofing shingles or heating and air equipment gets shipped directly to the homeowner, they go install it and then they log off on the app and it could really shake things up. So I think keeping our eye on technology and what's out there is key. Fantastic. Well, I know we're reaching the end of our time here, folks. I know we're 60 seconds over our commitment to you. So what I want to, Andrew, if you don't mind, unmute yourself, Andrew, I want to give you a chance to bring us uh, to a close here and uh, give us an opportunity to find out more about you and the best postcards if folks are interested. So Andrew, the floor is yours for a moment, and then I will let us know what's happening from here. Go ahead. So I forget uh, whether it was Dave or Matt who was talking about defining your avatar and finding out who your client is and how to find more people like that. To anyone who joined this webinar, we're, if you're interested, if you were very data and analytically based, if you send us a list to, to your customer list in a CVS format, you don't need the names of the clients. We're not in the list data storage business. We can give you NDAs. Anybody who we do business with gets exclusivity anyway. So, but we'd be willing to do this for you. We'll plot it out on a 3D heat map for you. We'll set you up with a data analyst. We'll get on the phone with you and screen share. We'll plot out where all your clients are coming from, where they're not coming from. We'll append data to them, income levels, home values, all that stuff. And if at the end of the day, it's something that you want to pursue, that's great. If it's not, then it's, it's something that we're at the, we're past the point of being a, a sales operation. We want to see and help small and large businesses grow. So there's no, no commitment whatsoever. And we can show you a ton about your business that you probably have no idea. 
and we'd be happy to do it. You know, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of people to want to do it. So just be patient that it might take, you know, a week to get through everybody, but no commitment. We're happy to do it. We'll send you all the files. We'll send you all the heat maps. We'll, we'll show you your customers and we'll show you where you should be looking for new customers. All right, folks, if you want to take Andrew up on that offer, we had the URL up there on the screen. I'm asking my team to drop it in, a, in Zoom and in LinkedIn again. So the bestpostcards.com, if you want to follow up with Andrew and the team on that. I'm going to ask you all a question here and then bring us to a close. So everybody who's still here, thank you for being here a few minutes past our time in Zoom and in LinkedIn. Here's my question for all of you. And I want you, everyone, this is an all play. I want everyone to respond if you're still here. What was the one thing that stood out to you today? Let's say the one new idea, the spark of insight, uh, some, some angle that Tom or David or Andrew or Josh shared today that stuck out to you. Take a moment, drop that in. Jessica Taft, I see you here in the chat, interested in following up with Andrew. So my team, please make sure that we connect Jessica with Andrew. Jessica, we'd love to speak to you. But I want to know that from all of you. Take a moment, go into chat. What is the thing that stood out to you today? Maybe the new insight, the new angle, the new spark, the new inspiration. Brad is saying that we need to have more regular partnered interactions with vendors. Laura is saying, whoa, it's going so quickly now. When a recession hits, lean in more. Drew, that's back to you, my man. That's what you said. Brenda, looking outside of our industry, to Josh's point, to be ahead of technology or business models. Yep. Lita saying in case of a recession, lean in, don't stop marketing. Carrie. Help build your culture with a happiness officer. Tom, looks like your happiness officer is getting some love here. Bob is saying another insight into recruiting. Michael says that we're all feeling the same things with the world right now. Thank you all very much. Donna is saying how to continue to grow during a recession. Daniel is saying my technicians are my customers. Interesting. Dave is saying relationships with partners and your employees are, is key. Jessica is saying maintaining brand consistency. Lamont is saying opening up your supply channels and becoming the servant leader. Interesting. Tom says it's not what happens, but how we react to it. Yep, my therapist always tells me that as well. John is saying the fact that when the recession hits, lean in more. Smart businessman shared once that to getting out of a rut is to sell yourself out. Yep, amazing. Well, folks, fantastic feedback coming in here. Keep that coming in. We appreciate you all being here. Thank you for your time. I want to say thank you to the panel. Uh, they've given us uh, of their time freely. And, and uh, Tom, Casey, to you, Josh, Matt, David, and of course, Andrew and the Best Postcards team. Thank you all for pulling this together. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to moderate the session. And to everybody who's here in the audience, you're the reason why we do this. We hope you got value out of today. If you have any questions, we will be following up with you after the session to get you the recording, get you the slides, get you the audio, get you the free resource that Josh mentioned. If you want time with Andrew or the Best Postcards team, go to thebestpostcards.com, fill out the form on any page there at the bottom of any of those pages, and we will get in touch with you all. Thank you all for being here today. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you, panel. Thank you, audience. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.